Welcome to Converge. Um, we're looking forward to a good night tonight, and I'm going to pray. Father, thank you for this evening of fellowship and worship and teaching with our fellow peers. Please speak to us through worship and through Mark. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Would y'all stand to your feet? We're going to sing some songs together tonight. Belongs to you. 
That's my hope for tonight, that every time we come together uh, with the church and every time we come together with other believers, that we would come in expecting God to do something in our hearts and in our lives. And, and the reality is, is that we all walked into the room tonight in different places. God's doing a different thing in your heart than he is in mine and in, in, in our life situation and circumstances and all that. And the good news is, is that the circumstances around us don't, don't matter in a way that would keep God from using it for his glory and for your good. So wherever you're at tonight, whatever you brought with you, that's cool. And it's different than maybe the person next to you. But God wants to use it to change your heart and to change your life and to make you look more like him. To give you opportunity to serve the people around you and the circumstances around you. So just in this moment, let's pray together and ask God to, to give us open ears tonight to hear from him and obedient hearts to follow him. Let's pray together. Lord, we just ask for you to change our hearts tonight. We, we all have our own lives and our own things that we're going through. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us to understand that you're working all of it together, that you're orchestrating all the things in our lives, which is so cool and so good that you who created the heavens and the earth, you that caused the wind to blow here and there, you that feed the mouths of the lions, that you would care for all of the little tiny details in my life. I'm so thankful for that and, and just believing that, that you are at work and that you have a plan for each one of us in this room. So Lord, tonight just speak to our hearts give us hearts that are willing to be obedient to you and whatever you have for us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And can 
This is the alley. This is the air. This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to Lord, even as I sing those lyrics right now in this moment, God, I just become so aware of how many days that we just walk through in our own power and our own mind and just unaware of what you're doing around us and inside of us. And Lord, I'm just reminded of the psalmist in Psalm 23 when he says, you know what, I have a good shepherd and, and I shall not want for anything else because there's really nothing else that can really satisfy us. And you know all those things in our hearts that, that satisfy for a moment. But Lord, I, I know that, that in my heart of hearts, that your presence and your word are the only things on this earth that will ever really satisfy my heart and mind. 
So forgive us where, where we focus on all the other things. Forgive us where we forget to acknowledge you in all of our ways. Forget that your word is a light to our path and a lamp to our feet. Would you just remind our hearts and our spirits of that tonight? And help us as we sit under your word here, here in a minute that you would just use it to change our hearts and continue to mold us to look like you, Jesus, to love like you, to think like you, and to be your ambassador and your representative in the little world and little space that you plopped us in. We give you all the glory for it, and we trust you. And Lord, satisfy us in you tonight. We love you and praise the name of Jesus. Amen. Good evening. All right, let's try that again. Good evening. Hey, listen, I'm glad to be back. This is a good week uh, for me. I'm going to grab this stool. It's a good week for me. I found out my youngest son, who's a senior in high school, actually got accepted to Institute 360, which is a Chick-fil-A uh, gap year program. And uh, they accept 75 students, so we're praising the Lord for that. Not only that, uh, today is Wednesday, which means it's my last day to work out for my week. I work out Saturday, Monday, and Wednesday, so I've ridden 28 miles this week, so it feels great. How many of y'all work out? Anybody work out? I know it's a couple of people. Okay, really. How many of y'all work? Listen, when I ask a question, raise your hand. How many of y'all work out? Okay, so we got four people, five people. Okay, working out's great. So anyway, listen, that, that song says so much. I'm reminded every time I hear that song uh, how desperate I am for, for God um, and how dependent I am upon him every time I stand to deliver his word. And, and so I'm reminded that God is sovereignly in control uh, he's divine, he's over all, and you are here tonight, and I'm here tonight, and I pray that God's word speaks to you. Uh, we've kind of come to the third and final week in our little series, Relationships and Marriage, the Kingdom Kind. And so if you've been with us, we've been kind of journeying through relationships. The first week we looked at uh, uh, how to be and find the right kind of friends, and last week we took a gut-wrenching look at the truth behind every marriage. And we looked at the reality that every marriage is not only two sinners coming together and living in a sinful world, but uh, there is an enemy at work who is seeking to destroy every marriage. So when you get married, there's going to be an enemy working behind the scenes to take you out, to take your marriage out. And statistically, we said last week, almost uh, close to 50, if not over 50% of all marriages uh, end a divorce today. And the, that's the kind of the truth behind every marriage. Uh, I think that's probably why Benjamin Franklin said, keep your eyes wide open before marriage and half shut afterwards. Uh, you know, that's the way that a lot of people go into marriage. And, and uh, last week, uh, the great warning to you as a young adult considering marriage was, was to be prepared. Uh, remember I said, uh, to expect the expected. But I also said, doing marriage according to God's plan uh, is really your path to success, and, and I, I didn't finish on this last week, but I think it's important to, to note, I, I am excited about being married. I've been married coming up on August the 14th. I'll be married 28 years, and uh, it's, a, it's a blessing. My wife, Mindy, completes me, uh, and I, I'm just to be honest with you, it gets better every year. We're learning to communicate better. You know, early on, we had, you know, goofy disagreements and arguments, but we are learning to communicate and get to a level of of intimacy that I never dreamt was possible, you know, uh, and uh, I can't imagine my life without my wife, but, you know, before you get married, you need to know what you're getting into, and you need to be prepared to invest in that, in that wedding relationship or that marriage relationship. Here's what Paul said. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians 5 real quick. Turn your, turn your Bibles. We're going to look at several passages tonight. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. I've got my scripture here. I've got one that I don't have in here. Uh, Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. Paul kind of tells us this, basically explains us this importance of, of really being prepared to invest and making wise choices. And look what he says. He says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. 
Paul's saying right there that, listen, you need to be prepared every day. And, and marriage is something you need to be prepared for. You need to be working towards saying, okay, what do I need to be doing in, in my little circle of influence to get ready for what God has for me going into the future with the person I'm going to spend the rest of my life week with. Um, last week's message was, was, uh, was not really meant to discourage you, but rather to encourage you to never really discount the, the sinful world that we live in, the sin that's in you, and the sin that your spouse will have inside of them, and the challenges that will come there. But, but, but also last week was a challenge to you not to discount the fact that that God is faithful, he's powerful, and he's willing to bless your marriage if you will do marriage in accordance with his word. So tonight we're going to answer this odd question, king and queen, but whose kingdom? King and queen, but whose kingdom? When it comes to marriage, that is an amazingly good question. Who's really in control, the king or the queen? A man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, but whose kingdom will it be? In our bathroom this past week, um, we had some little visitors that, that came in, some little, some little critters that came into our bathroom, and their attraction point was the tip of my wife's toothbrush. My wife hates bugs, all right? She cannot stand bugs. And so they were ants, real small ants. And for a couple of nights over the weekend, last weekend, uh, these ants would come in and they would just load up on the internet and she's like, oh, she'd just like get in there and scream and bang her toothbrush and she'd start pounding the ants and killing the ants. It's like, hey, listen, we, you know, to get rid of a, an ant, you got to get rid of the queen. So we went and bought some, some bait poison and I set the bait poison right next to where her toothbrush was and I opened it up and I put a little bit on the counter and I, her toothbrush was in between where they were coming. Well, I went in that afternoon and came in there to see where they were. Well, they were still on top of her toothbrush because they never made it past her toothbrush. So I banged the ants off her toothbrush and laid them on the counter, laid, put the ants back on the counter because I wanted them to be out. And I set the toothbrush up where they can, and then I kind of moved an ant kind of just over toward that. And I mean, you should have, I mean, it's like, I couldn't see the ant's face, obviously, but it's almost like I could see the ant's face. I mean, it's like that ant went over there and stuck his chops down in that thing. And I mean, it's like, he just like, just started filling up. Well, I mean, he actually walked inside the, of the pod and started just like right on top of the stuff. It was just soaking it up. It was hilarious to, to watch it. And all these other ants are running around trying to figure out, you know, what's going on. And, and, and he, then he came out. And if you've ever seen ants, watch ants. I mean, they have these little tentacles. And the ant that had his mouth full that had been sucking on all the poison went and on the way back to the deal, every ant that he passed, they would rub tentacles and that ant was like, it's almost like he's saying, hey, the good stuff's right over here. And it's like, then every ant after him just kept going into there. And pretty soon they filled the whole thing up. And today, the ants are gone. <laughs> They're gone. You know what I think about? You know, what, you know what's unique about all those ants? Everything those ants did was in allegiance to the queen. Everything they did. They were living in her world, under her rule. And in that moment, they were in pursuit of what they thought was best for the queen. That sounds a lot like our little kingdom of self, does it not? We all live in this little kingdom of self. I want you to turn in your Bibles now to Matthew chapter 4, and then we're going to flip over to Matthew chapter 6 and read a section of scripture there, but you can kind of see where I'm going with this, this, the title of my message this, this evening, King and Queen, but Whose Kingdom? This little passage of scripture here is the first sermon that Jesus preached. It's really short, and I think Jesus probably preached this sermon more than once. I think he preached it multiple times. Look what it says. It says, from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. Jesus is saying, turn from what you thought was the right kingdom and turn to the kingdom of heaven. As you look forward to your future marriage, when you think about which kingdom you're living for, remember this on the screen behind me. Everything we do in this life is in allegiance to and in pursuit of either the kingdom of self or the kingdom of God. Everything you do, 
Everything that you pursue in this life is in the kingdom of, is in the pursuit of one of those two, two kingdoms, the kingdom of self or the kingdom of God. Now turn in your Bibles to flip over to Matthew chapter 6. We're not going to read the entire scripture on the, on the screen behind me, but we're going to start in verse 26. I want you to see this is, this is a great passage of scripture, and I think this kind of, this is kind of a summation, okay, we're going to come to verse 33, we're going to start in verse 25, but as we're reading this, really this whole section of scripture begins in verse 19, but what I want you to understand between verses 19 and 24, we, we get a description of the kingdom of self. Jesus is giving us the description, and then that conjunction, but changes everything and turns our perspective to the kingdom of God. Look at what it says in verse 26. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the, to the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. And here it is right here. But everything changes right there. Everything before that was the kingdom of self. Now we start talking about the kingdom of God. But seek first the kingdom of God and all these things that were just mentioned. For clothing, for food, for welfare, all these things will be added to, to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. That word but tells us this verse in verse uh, 26 is the, is the transition point in the passage. Or 28, what passage is that again? It's not the right one. 33. tells us that verse 33 is really the transition point. But seek first the kingdom of God. And, 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 and sometime, go back and study that passage. That's not going to be our key passage tonight, but there's, there's a lot of truth in there about the kingdom of self. And, and you need to know the kingdom of self, the kingdom of self battle rages in every believer. It rages in every person that roams this earth. It's there. It goes back to what we talked about with the sin. When I counsel couples, and they're at each other's throat, in their minds, they think the battle is with the other person in their marriage. But here's the reality. All the horizontal battles are the fruit of a deeper war. All the horizontal battles that we go into in this life are the, are the fruit of a deeper war. You see, in your future marriage, in my marriage, the most important war that will ever need to be won is not the war a couple is having with, you, with each other. It's the war that rages within them in defense of their kingdom of self. Every argument you have will be in defense of your kingdom. Every one. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Here Paul kind of, look at verses 14 and 15. If you don't have a Bible, you can look on the screen behind me. Here Paul summarizes what sin does to us all. He says this, For the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves. So that they might no longer live for their kingdom of one, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. You see, if we don't learn to tackle sin, sin will tackle us. It will tackle us. Maybe it's tackling you right now. Maybe there's a struggle in your life that you're, you're walking through, and that sin just has you just in, in the grips, and, and you can't get out. And part of the reason you're in those grips is because it's the kingdom of self that's controlling you, and the kingdom of God sets you free from those kind of things. 
sin turns us actually in on ourselves. It reduces our life into the narrow confines of our little self-defined world, if you will. It shrinks, it shrinks our focus, our motivation, and even our concern to the size of our own wants and desires and wishes. That's what sin does. Our little kingdom of self leads us to, to elevate ourselves over everyone else around us. And when you get married, it will lead you to elevate yourself over your spouse. Because of sin, we are offended most by those offenses against us. Because of sin, we are concerned most for what concerns us. Because of sin, we tend to think of no one else but ourselves. Do you know what you're going to really want when you get married? You're going to want your spouse to love you as much as you love you. That's what you're going to want. You're going to want your spouse to love you as much as you love yourself. Just like that queen ant. We're all looking for a willing submission to the plans and purposes of our claustrophobic kingdom of one. That's what we all want. And I want you to know, as you think about going into your marriage, it cannot be about your kingdom. It has to be about his kingdom. And when it's about his kingdom, it revolutionizes how you see life, how you see your spouse, how you see your kids, and how you see your future. It changes everything. So the question in our title tonight is an important question. We live in the service of one of two kingdoms, the small personal happiness agenda of the kingdom of self, or we live in the service of the huge origin to destiny agenda of the kingdom of God. And as Christians, this side of heaven, there is a constant war being fought in our hearts to win this battle. I cannot tell you how many times my kingdom of self has gotten in the way of the, of the beauty that God wanted me and my wife to have in our marriage. I can't tell you how many times the kingdom of self gets in the way. But the good news is this. Over time, this harsh reality I'm, I'm faced with in my marriage that you'll be faced with in your marriage has become an opportunity for me to exit the small space of the kingdom of self and enter into the domain of God's kingdom and, and see things differently. To, to walk into an argument or to stand next to my wife and be frustrated about something and to realize, hey, it's not about my kingdom. It's about his kingdom. It changes our perspective. So tonight what I want to do is I'm going to give you three things we must do in our marriages. If I want to be, if I want to have the kind of marriage that God intends me to have, there's three things that I must do. Here's the first one. I must live in my marriage with a grace mentality. I must live in my marriage with a grace mentality. You see, God didn't give us his grace to make our kingdom work better. God gave us his grace to invite us to a much better kingdom. I want you to think about how committed you currently are to your own kingdom of purposes. This past month, how many of you all got angry about something? Did you get angry? Well, let me explain to you kind of what happened. On one morning, my youngest son, Manason, was needing to go to school, and my, his car was broke down, so my wife texted me and said, hey, you need to take Manason to school. So Mason hadn't eaten breakfast. He, he got up late. He hadn't eaten breakfast. So I said, hey, let's run through McDonald's. And so right there at 160, 174th, 164th in May, there's a McDonald's. And when you come in off of... Uh, 164th, you can actually turn in the back road. Well, we turned in the back road in my truck and went around, and most people usually come in off of May and turn in, and the driveway's right there. Well, this, there's a sign there that says, any lane, any time. So when I pulled in, Mason was with us, and we were kind of in a rush, and when I pulled in, there were five cars backed up on the inside lane getting in, and then and, and they would come through, and then they would kind of circle around and, and get into the lane. So there was only one car in the outside lane. I'd seen that sign hundreds of times because I'd been to McDonald's line getting coffee numerous times. And so I whipped in from the side road and pulled in. And as soon as I did that, a guy pulled over next to me with his window down. And, I mean, he was foaming out of his mouth. His window's down. He was in a BMW. It's like, you're cutting all of us off. You're, you cut us all off. And look at all of us waiting in line. You're supposed to wait till you pass the sign. I said, no, the sign actually says you can exit. I mean, you can, you can go any time. No, it doesn't. It doesn't say that. I started thinking, wait a minute. Maybe I'm wrong here. I said, okay, hey, I'm sorry. And I said, I'll move. And so I just kind of pulled out and went around. And he was right in front of me. He pulled around. And 
he pulled up right in that in that single line. I'm thinking, there there it was, plain as day. You know, any lane, any time. As soon as he saw it, he whipped around and went around there. So of course me, you know, I've got to have the last word. All right, wrong. Not supposed to be that way. But I, my son's like, Dad, don't do it. Dad, don't do it. So I pulled up next to him, over, and I said, Hey, buddy. I said, uh, He's like. And I was like, hey, buddy, did you see that sign? It said, any lane, any time. You were wrong. I don't know. I said, forget it, man. I just put it in reverse and went back and back and behind him. But in that moment, I was angry. I was really angry. I don't know about you, but when you get angry, when I get angry, my blood pressure goes up. I can feel it. It's like my neck's swelling and my head feels like it's going to pop. And, and so we get angry. And, and we come to that point where, you know, we, we, we think about all those little angry moments and, and those things tend to control, control us. I mean, maybe it's driving down the road. Maybe it's waiting on traffic. Maybe it's something like that. Uh, how? Here's my question. How kingdom-oriented is our anger? How kingdom-oriented is our anger? When we're mad at someone, we're not, we're not mad at them because they've broken the law of God. We're mad or grieved because they're standing in the way of what we want. We're, we're angry and mad because they're standing in, way, in the way of what we want. Our, sel- our, our anger seldom comes out of a zeal for the plans, purposes, values, and calling of the kingdom of God. You see, in a marriage when someone is hurt or angry or disappointed with their spouse, it's not because they've broken one of the laws of God's kingdom and it really concerns them. No, they are most often angry because their spouse has broken the law of their kingdom and they see them standing in the way of what they want and it makes them mad it makes them want to do things and act certain ways and say certain things that will somehow rein their spouse back into the service of their little kingdom of one see God's grace is intended to explode all of that it's intended to blow that whole idea out of the water. In God's kingdom, there is grace to live by. On the screen behind us, it says, God's grace purposes to expose me and free me from my bondage to me. That's what grace does. God's grace is meant to bring me to the end of myself so that I will finally begin to place my identity, my meaning, my purpose, my inner sense of well-being, my life in him and in his hands. So what does God do to accomplish that? God will place you in a comprehensive relationship with another flawed person. He will place you in a relationship right in the middle of a very broken world. And to add to the already tumultuous situation, he actually will design circumstances that you would have never designed for yourself. And it's all meant to bring you to the end of yourself because that is where true righteousness and true life begins to be experienced. That's when you start to live for the kingdom of God. See, the troubles you will one day face in your marriage will not be the failure of grace. Your marriage troubles, we alluded to this last week, will be the tools God uses to pry you out of the life-depleting confines of your kingdom of self so that you can be free to engage and enjoy and live free and have all the blessings and benefits and bounty of God's kingdom. Which brings me to my second point. This is the second thing I must do if I'm going to have the kind of kingdom marriage that God wants me to have. I must live in my marriage with an investment mentality. With an investment mentality. Flip over to Matthew chapter 6 again if you're turned away from there. Look at this passage one more time. I think it's important to, to see this. And I'm going to quote a scripture from a couple of weeks ago that we shared because I think these two things are right in line with this investment mentality. Jesus said, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things. And I want to add, even those good things that pertain to a good marriage. Jesus was referring to all these basic elements of life, food and clothing, If God can take care of those little things, God can take care of the big things. And sometimes the big things unfold in our marriages. But if we seek first the kingdom of God, he adds all those things to us. And you can look 
back up a little bit further in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, Jesus reminds us, and I remind you, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and thieves cannot break in and steal. And Jesus said this very important thing, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's a great reminder for us of what we need to pursue. And see, we are all treasure hunters. Every person in this room is a treasure hunter. We all live to gain, to maintain, to keep, and to enjoy things that are valuable to us. And how we behave in any given situation in life is our attempt to kind of get what is valuable to us out of whatever that situation might be. So when we get mad and we start yelling or we sulk or we pout, when things aren't going our way, that's kind of the way that we act. That's our way of acting out. There are some things in your life that you have assigned importance to. And once you have them, you're no longer to w live without them. There's things that you see as valuable. And you say, man, this is what I want. And here's the deal. If you don't make the adjustment now and you get married and your future spouse infringes upon them, you are going to act out every time. Everyone does it when they're focused on the kingdom of self. We live to possess and experience the things upon which we set our hearts. And that, those two passages are key passages for us to understand. We need to be seeking first the kingdom of God. Then everything else follows that. And every treasure you set your heart on and actively seek, that treasure is going to maintain and keep your attention there. For example, you, th you think about the return Every argument that you enter into, you know, when you're going to, you, you, when you fight for something, there is a return that you're wanting. And, and here's a, just a, a little quote, an argumentative moment in an investment is an investment. You're basically, you're investing because you're, you want it. An argumentative moment is an investment in the treasure of being right. You want to be right. You can talk to my wife. That's one of the things that I struggled with early on. I want to be right. I want to be right. I come to the family. Of, I'm the second oldest of nine kids. I was probably the loudest of all the boys. I stood out. And I always wanted to be right. And that damaged, at times, my marriage early on. And I had to learn, you know what? I don't have to be right. Guys, in the future, if you aggressively argue your wife into a corner, it is not likely that the return on that investment is going to be she appreciates you and wants to engage you in conversation in the future. Ladies, in the future, if you defiantly disrespect your husband, he's going to feel threatened and dishonored, and the return of your disrespect is going to probably lead to his withdrawal and maybe even him acting out in ways that are not holy and not of God. We invest every day, and we are seldom able to escape the return on the investments that we have made. Ask yourself, what are the things that are valuable to you right now? What are the things that are valuable to you right now? What are the things that you are unwilling to live without? What are those things? What would make that list? Now ask yourself, how is the return on those investments shaping your life? How are they shaping your life? Here's what you need to know. Not only will it shape your life, it will one day shape your marriage. What you want will one day shape your marriage. And if the war between the kingdom of self and the kingdom of God is not being won when you get married, you will enter your marriage driven by your little kingdom of self. This is at the heart of every major problem a Christian couple will ever face in their marriage. And it's not just with you as an individual, it will be with your spouse. He or she will be taking that very same thing into your marriage. And if you don't have a kingdom focus, as we go back to finding the right friends and finding the right uh, groups that were being the right friend, if you don't have the right people around you, you'll end up with the wrong person. You'll end up with a person that maybe doesn't have a, a center, a, a Christ as the center, and they will not have a kingdom focus. Have you ever tried to place a value on the kingdom of God? Stop and think about that. 
you ever tr just, just try to think about how valuable is the kingdom of God? Jesus did. I'm going to show you two verses. Matthew chapter 13, or three verses. Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 through 46. Jesus actually described the kingdom of heaven this way. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and he sells all that he has, and he buys that field. It's a great analogy. Jesus was great at giving us parables and stories. He said, basically, it's like a treasure hidden in the field. A guy finds it. He says, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and bury it. I'm going to buy the field. He's, he's, he, he takes all this money, all of his possessions. He sells everything. And he takes the money to buy that field. That's how valuable it was. Again, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And here he tells us why. Because the kingdom of heaven is enormously valuable. It's enormously valuable. And when and if a husband and wife will begin to live with purpose and, 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 and intentionality, they will begin to discover what it means to live under the kingdom of God or in the kingdom of God. I love that thought, and, and I, I love the thought of just, I, I think about where I was entering into marriage, you know, almost 28 years ago, and I think about where I am today and how different this little principle has made for me and my wife. So finally, if I'm going to have the kingdom of marriage that God intends me to enjoy, I must live in my marriage with a grace mentality. I must live in my marriage with an investment mentality. And number three, and finally, I must live in my marriage with a harvest mentality. I must live in my marriage with a harvest mentality. Galatians 6, 7 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man or woman or married couple sows, this they will also reap. You know, there is an organic relationship between the seeds that we plant and the fruits that we harvest. You plant an apple seed, you get an apple. You plant a peach seed, you get a peach. That's the principle. But in the same way, there is an organic consistency between the seeds of the words and the actions and the deeds that we plant in our marriage. And there is this harvest of a certain quality of relationship that begins to unfold. And I can tell you, every couple that I sit down with, the struggles that they have, if they're not planting the right seeds with words and deeds and actions, man, it's not, it's not yielding much fruit. There's a correlation there. And every day, Mindy and I harvest relational plants that come from the se these seeds and words and actions that we have previously planted in the weeks and months and years before. And the, with the beginning of each new day, we, we, try, we strive to plant these seeds and words and actions so that we can begin to harvest and enjoy that harvest. And when you get married, most of the seeds you plant will be very small. They'll be small. But 1,000 small seeds that grow up into trees will result in an environment-changing forest. Think about that. My wife and I are enjoying the seeds we've planted through the years, and we are well protected. Someone once said that marriage is a beautiful thing that only reaches what it was designed to be through the methodology of a painful process. And the painful process involves letting go of our little kingdom of one. Our problem is we don't like difficulties. We don't like pain and suffering. There are many of us that would rather have an easy life than a God-honoring life. And in actuality, and I discovered this, the battle really begins with God. When we read God's word, he gives us truth. And when we ignore it and we go our own way, we're not taking those little things. And, and, and we're reminded in God's word that when we're faithful to little things, God blesses us with much. And some of you need to learn to be faithful to just the little things because the little things make a difference. But when we fight God's plan and we critique his will and we bring him into the court of our judgment, we find him guilty and 
unloving and unkind, which he's not. Man, our whole world, our whole perspective gets skewed. We begin to follow our own kingdom of self. And if there's anything you need to know this evening is this, that God's, God's near you. He loves you. He's got a plan for you. And you think about what's happening in your life, I, I want you to know that, that God wants you to take ground today. God wants you to take ground today in your life. Why? So that you can take ground in your marriage one day. And you don't take ground in your life today by living in your little old kingdom world of one. You take ground by learning to understand what it means to live underneath God's kingdom and in God's kingdom and for God's kingdom. That's what changes us. And, you know, I think about where I'm at in closing. I think about all the little bricks of words and comments and good deeds and things that my wife is just, we've, we've constructed a wall of protection around our marriage because of the little things that we've done. And the challenge for you today is to learn to do the little things in here so that you'll be prepared to lay those bricks and build walls of protection around your marriage. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. You think about God's kingdom and you think about where you are, I don't know, some of you might be dating someone really serious. Maybe some of you have your eyes on someone that you would like to get serious with. Maybe some of you have no clue who it is that you're going to marry. That's okay. Right now, what's most important for you is to realize that in God's kingdom, there is, there's grace to live by, there's an investment to make, and there is a harvest to reap. And if you would live your life today with that principle, when you step into your marriage, your whole life will be radically different. And you will be able to take up the mantle of marriage in a way that would bring glory and honor to God, which is your ultimate purpose. Your ultimate purpose is to bring glory to God. And I pray that everything that I've shared over the past three weeks or the past three times I've, I've shared, that, that it would just speak to your heart and that, that God would just minister to you in a way that, uh, that you would be open to what he wants to do in your life. God's word is truth. It's been a great honor for me to share it. Let me close in prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you for loving us. I thank you, Lord, for your kingdom. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that you give us to live in your kingdom. And it's such a choice, God, that, that uh, we all uh, really have to make, uh, a choice for moving from the kingdom of self uh, to the kingdom of God. And, God, there's some challenges for us. We thank you, God, that in your kingdom there's grace. We thank you, God, that in your kingdom, God, there's, there's an opportunity to plant and that, God, in your kingdom, there's an opportunity to the harvest. And, Lord, looking back over 28 years of life, I could not even begin to imagine the beauty of the relationship that I have with my sweet wife. And, Lord, I, I pray for every young person in this room. I pray, God, that they would begin uh, the process, God, of just living in your kingdom, uh, striving to, uh, to serve you and to separate themselves from their selfish kingdom of one and begin to really look at your kingdom and what it means. And, Lord, I thank you for Jesus' words, a God, when he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's a kingdom that we were all called to live in. Lord, if we would repent of our sins and, and ask Jesus into our hearts, God, we are your children. And because we are your children, God, we have an opportunity, God, to reign and to live in that kingdom. Even today, as sinful people living in this sinful world with an enemy that is, is, uh, is against us, God. We have an opportunity to do great things. And so, Father, we thank you. We love you. We thank you for your word. We ask these things in your son's wonderful name. Amen.